This episode will have a special extended B-side cut exclusively on spinitpod.com, so be sure to swing on by and check it out. I've listened to Scorpion by Drake for a couple months. And I listened to it once yesterday. Welcome to Spin It. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Spin It, the record-ranking podcast for people who would rather be listening to music. I'm James, and with me, as usual, is Connor. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, hi, hi. And this week, we are talking about Drake. What a guy. I'm excited for a Drake episode. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm excited. I'm always excited. That's true. You are easily excitable. Hey, you're not wrong. (laughs) (laughs) I know I'm not wrong. So Drake is an artist. He's interesting. He's one I've wanted to look into for a long, long time. I've wanted to put on the Albums of the Month playlist. I've been so curious for so long. But he just puts out such long albums. And for the longest time, I just couldn't find enough room on my Albums of the Month playlist. You know, I usually try and keep it to a reasonable amount of songs and a reasonable length that I can really familiarize myself with it over the course of a month. And all his albums are like double albums albums, you know, 18, 20, 30 tracks, like, they're hefty. And one month, I finally had enough space that I could fit in a Drake album, and I was like, oh no, which one do I pick? Like, who knows when I'm gonna get another? Because I hadn't really had any exposure to Drake, you know? Sure. Yeah, so I went with Scorpion because... I was actually decently familiar with God's Plan and In My Feelings, probably two of the most basic Drake songs of all time to be familiar with, but that's where I decided to start. And I listened to this album, and it surprised me for, I guess, reasons that I won't spoil right now that we'll get into, but I was surprised. Do you have any Drake history? Not really, no. That does not surprise me. Maybe not, okay, maybe not as a musician. Do you have any Drake experience with, like, Degrassi and acting? You ever watched Degrassi? I did not watch Degrassi. So I know about Drake from, like, the memes. He's he's a memed artist. That's true. Yeah, I guess that counts as Drake exposure. I found some wild facts about Drake memes. Yeah? Yeah. We'll get to them. I put them in my notes. We'll talk about them. And I couldn't name any of them, but I know I know some Drake songs. Mm. Yeah, the first time I actually intentionally listened to Drake, I was in the car with some other folks and they said, you've never listened to Drake? And I was like, no, I know, right? And then they made me sit down and listen to the motto. That was my very first Drake song. And Mm. that one surprised me too. I was like, okay. What's the motto? Nothing much. What's the motto with you? Oh, God. Gosh, <laughs> that's a timeless joke. Drake's motto is YOLO, on the other hand. Which, didn't we talk about YOLO lately? I think we said it was one of the best words of the 2010s. Yeah. It was the snail mail episode when we talked about popular slang. Was it really? Yeah. That's surprisingly recent. Mm-hmm. I know. Yeah, Drake's motto is YOLO. Weird motto for Drake, I think. But anyway, that's not Scorpion. One of the other reasons that I picked Drake for you was, I mean, the last experience we had with rap music was Wiz Khalifa and Rolling Papers, right? Pop rap, kind of synthy, sparkly, singy kind of rap. Mm-hmm. And you liked it. You gave it a nine. And I was curious to see how the Drake brand of rap would kind of land now that I know that new information. I see. you trying to... Dial it in a little more. Yeah, fine tune where your tastes lie. I'm throwing darts at the dartboard. Fair enough. I think it's kind of similar to Rolling Papers in some ways. And in other ways, not at all. So we'll get into it. But I think there's hope. (laughs) I have hope for Drake, but I'm tentatively cautious. Is that redundant? Either way, you get the idea. This is going to be, like I said, Drake makes long albums. So we're going to have to make a long episode. We're doing a couple quick B-sides in quick succession here. SZA came out not long ago. Drake's coming out now. Which is actually funny because they used to date. So the fact that they're both getting B-side episodes so close together, I don't know. Maybe there's something to that. Or maybe it was arbitrary. That's my theory because I did it. (laughs) Anyway, you can find all the songs and all of our thoughts about all the things and all of Connor's jokes like the motto one over at spinitpod.com. But you'll still find plenty right here, right now. Should I teach you about Drake? You're going to whether I want to or not. That's true. Honestly, a fascinating guy. I was shocked just to go through Drake's story and his life and some of the statistics that we'll get to. Aubrey Drake Graham, his first name is Aubrey, if you didn't know, he goes by Drake. He was born in 1986 in Toronto, Ontario. That's the same year that Reba's album came out, (laughs) Whoever's in New England. Oh. I associate them both with very different time periods, but what do you know? Yeah. Born in the same year, those two. Wild. Mm Mm-hmm. Drake's dad 
was a Memphis drummer who all the sources that I found said once performed with Jerry Lee Lewis. So I don't know if that meant he regularly performed with Jerry Lee Lewis for a while or if he did it one time or what. But that's <laughs> a really cool musical tie-in. That is. Jerry Lee Lewis, he's like a, a bit infamous for, you know, certain relative reasons. But he's kind of a legend in the evolution of music. So yeah, Drake's dad's a drummer. Drake's mom was a florist and a teacher. His parents divorced, though, when he was five, and Drake stayed in Toronto with his mom while his dad went back down south to Memphis. He grew up happy, but the family grew up pretty strapped for cash. Drake says that they rented half of a house. Drake also shares a couple of fun, unique characteristics with other artists that we've talked about, like Snail Mail's Lindsay Jordan. Drake grew up playing hockey. It was kind of his early passion. Typical, I guess, for a Canadian artist. Stereotypical, in fact. But he loved it. And he was pretty good. Actually, he was good enough to get noticed by the NHL. Mm. Not for his hockey playing, but for his acting. Because the NHL featured 10-year-old Drake in a very, very funny skit about goalies scoring goals at the NHL awards one year. <laughs> He's not playing real hockey in that. He's playing table hockey. Ah. Yeah, but it's a really funny commercial. You should look it up. But that brings me to the second thing that makes Drake kind of a more unique case for us. It's his acting career. When he was 15, he was cast as Jimmy Brooks in the teen drama Degrassi. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you heard of it when we mentioned it at the start of this episode. <laughs> Maybe you're hearing about it for the first time now because you scrubbed ahead. Either way. Maybe you were just zoned out when we said that the first time and just now tuning back in. If you don't catch anything else from this whole episode, remember this. Drake was in Degrassi. <laughs> if that's all you get from this episode, well, so be it. All of that leads into Drake's 2009 breakout mixtape called So Far Gone. It got 2,000 downloads within hours. Suddenly, Drake's an overnight success. Every label wants Drake. People claim there's a record label bidding war over Drake was the biggest bidding war ever in the music business, which kind of has to inflate your ego a little bit, doesn't it? I don't know. If you know that you're the most wanted guy out there. Yeah, probably doesn't hurt it. <laughs> no. Drake ended up signing with Young Money Entertainment by the summer of 2009. His first proper album, Thank Me Later, came out in 2010, officially kind of kickstarting an unbelievable career in records. Every single one of Drake's records has topped the Billboard charts. I'm not talking top 10. I'm not talking top five. Every single Drake album has been number one on the Billboard charts. Wow. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk about some of his other ridiculous chart records later on in the episode. You might be able to find those on the B-side. There's so many unbelievable things. Suddenly, Drake's got Grammys. Drake's got Juno Awards. Drake's got Platinum Records. Shows that he had planned had to get canceled by police because overflowing crowds were causing riots. Drake is just off the charts. <laughs> His second record, Take Care, is the one that spawned hits like The Motto in Marvin's Room and Headlines. It earned a Best Rap Album Grammy and has been certified six times platinum. Next up for Drake was Nothing Was The Same. And then he surprise dropped the ambiguous, if you're reading this, it's too late. And then we get into what I guess I kind of call modern Drake, right? The era where, at least in my life, Drake became a lot more prominent and a lot more talked about. And I feel like he started releasing a lot of singles that maybe more casual people, more non-Drake fans would know or have heard on the radio. For example, his fourth studio album, Views, spawned the hit Hotline Bling. <laughs> in 2016. You know Hotline Bling. I, I guarantee almost everybody listening to this podcast, almost anybody using the internet, has seen at least two frames of Hotline Bling, the music video. Which frames? The ones that constitute the meme of, of Drake approving things in that dance sequence. You know the one. Oh, Orange yeah, coat, yeah, 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 yellow yeah. background. All you gotta do is Google search Drake meme, and it's everywhere. Yep, yep, yep. Other hits from Views include One Dance and Too Good with Rihanna. Each of those led to billions of streams. And that brings us up to Scorpion, right? Where we're hanging out today. Scorpion is Drake's ambitious fifth record, big old double album, and it came out in mid-2018. Drake executive produced all of Scorpion by himself. Oh, wow. I know. And what he kind of did, I don't know if you picked up on it at all, but he's got the album broken into two discs, right? The first disc tracks 1 through 12, Survival Through, Is There More. It's a hip-hop oriented disc. The second disc that goes all the way from peak down to March 14 is kind of more 
R&B centric, kind of pop leaning, a little less hip hop, right? That's kind of how he's chosen to segment the album. And I actually like one of those discs better than the other, if I'm honest. Did you have a half that you liked better? You don't have to tell me which half yet. I'm just curious if you had one half or the other that you'd rank above. Oh, well, in that case, I'm going to say yes, and I'll figure it out by the time we get the final spin. By the time we get there, okay. <laughs> I mean, there's very little chance that I liked both halves equally that's true listen to that it's such a cliffhanger you're hanging off the cliff yourself yeah and don't scrub ahead like you did with the degrassi thing you know listen to the whole episode that's right darn it (laughs) so yeah anyway drake executive produces all of scorpion but there are more than 30 other producers on the record too each varying from track to track lot of cooks in the kitchen for scorpion 25 songs with 30 producers is a lot if you're looking for influences to kind of compare and contrast drake's sound to drake's biggest inspirations come from major contemporaries like kanye like jay-z like little wayne but he also really loved a lot of artists like usher mf doom jamaican musician vibes cartel he's kind of drawing from a wide range of practically contemporary hip-hop and R&B. Yeah. And it's all rolled up into one Drakey package. Scorpion got seven big singles, some of which you probably heard, maybe, or heard of before this episode. You have to tell me how many of these seven you knew. But I'm guessing based on what you said at the beginning, it's probably zero. Pretty much zero, yeah. I didn't recognize them. Okay. I guess you don't listen to, like pop radio or any radio where drake would be i don't listen to the radio at all oh well then he definitely wouldn't be where you listen i listen to spotify and i honestly don't listen to a lot of music outside this podcast now i listen to podcasts and then whatever music i have to listen to for this podcast and then any other extra time is spent with like musicals or the spin of favorite songs playlist heck yeah that playlist is getting big it is right now the playlist is Almost 19 hours long. 18 and a half. And yet somehow Kanye always shows up. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry. As apparently is the usual for Drake, fans loved it. The record as a whole broke Spotify and Apple's single day global stream record with 132.4 million streams and 170 million streams on Spotify then Apple respectively. Those records have since been broken, but that's huge. (laughs) And as apparently is also the usual for Drake, critics seemed kind of middling on it. Not his best work. Critics called it beautifully rendered, but tiresome megalomania, said the LA Times. You know, it's just more Drake, basically. Tired and tiring. Oddly erratic. Exhausting. Uneven. Trying to be all things to all people. It's another Drake album. It's exactly like the last four. I mean, those are generally the sentiments and quotes that I gleaned from critical reviews of scorpion Hmm. they also as i suspect you connor might be about to do disliked the length of the album and they said nope nope 25 tracks is too much drake too much drake not enough cake too much drake not enough cake (laughs) i thought you were gonna just say too much drake not enough space and do like a whole space drake thing i started to say space actually yeah i mean that was gonna be what i said but then i decided i didn't want to say space I wanted to change both lines. Mm-hmm. I went with cake because it rhymed. It did. That's kind of a good review for this album too. Not a lot of sweet spots on here. <laughs> like in terms of tone and lyrical content, kind of a heavy album. Yeah, I knew what I was doing. Yeah, mm, I wouldn't go that far, but you did it anyway. <laughs> but, you know, despite all the ire that it drew from some very vocal critics, Scorpion landed at number 15 on Billboard's year-end best list of 2018, and it earned two 2019 Billboard Awards for Top Billboard 200 Album and Top Rap Album. It also got that coveted nomination for the Grammy's Album of the Year, his second, actually, in a very impressive back-to-back run. He lost, believe it or not, to Casey Musgraves' Golden Hour from episode two. Oh. That was the album of the year. I don't know if I even realized it when we did the episode. That's crazy. It really is. Tons of connections to our past episodes. Right, I know. And that's why I think a Drake episode is kind of cool for a lot of reasons. Scorpion was so popular with the fans. No joke. What I'm about to say is real. Scorpion went platinum the day before it came out. The day before? The day before it was released. It had gone platinum for selling a million album equivalent units. It's because of a technicality where they used 
previously released single streams that got incorporated into the track equivalent units moved by the record. So, the three massive pre-release singles in God's Plan, Nice For What, and I'm Upset were enough to push all of Scorpion over the platinum record threshold the day before release. Drake's won 193 major awards. That's just the wins. Nominations? Probably uncountable. Don't even try. Drake's been nominated for 55 Grammys, and he's won five of them. Take Care won the Best Rap Album, Hotline Bling won the Best Rap Slash Sung Performance and Best Rap Song, God's Plan won Best Rap Song, Wait For You got Best Melodic Rap Performance actually just this past year. And he also holds the record for the most one-night Billboard Music Award wins, passing Adele when he won 13 awards on 22 nominations back in 2017. Anyway, that's it. That's all I've got the time to talk about <laughs> and in fact maybe even more so yeah we done yeah that's drake in the nutshell that's the overview of drake other trivia tidbits drake has one son we'll talk about it when we get into the album because one of the cool things about scorpion is it's kind of his way of responding to and kind of confirming a lot of rumors and things that people were saying about him you know in feuds and in fights and stuff this is him owning the narrative around his paternity really interesting situation on scorpion and speaking of you know drake's really known for his feuds in his business ventures and his lavish lifestyle i mean the guy is living a life I can't even imagine. So I decided not to dig too much into that. I wanted to let the mixtaper have a crack at all that stuff. And speaking of which, I believe it is time for the mixtaper to once again reappear. Yeah? Yeah, is he ready? I, I'm not sure how ready I am. I think the mixtaper is feeling a bit territorial this week. Territorial? Why is that? Uh, it's, I'll, I'll let him get into it. Yeah, territorial is not a good thing to be. Am I in his territory? You're here every week. Uh, unless you're saying he's territorial every week. I mean, maybe. <laughs> I don't know what he's territorial over. Get him in here. Let him tell me. Hey, it's me, the mixtaper. Hello, mixtaper. How are you? Are, why are you feeling territorial? I'm the dastard of the podcast. I'm the big bad super villain with an alter ego as a Starbucks barista. Okay. Yeah. Who it's else? Me. Who else has the the alter ego? Who? What? We'll get to it on the B side. If you're listening to normal cut. Get on over to the B-side at www.spinitpod.com. Oh, okay, deep cut. So we'll learn about territorial mixtaper later. See, I'm also really good at promoting things. I, I can promote things. I never said or insinuated that you couldn't, I think. Oh, I just Lewis and I really need this job and I didn't want you to give it to Drake. I'm not going to give this job to Drake. He's got everything else and I don't think he would take it if I offered to pay him for it. So it's all yours. Man, this is a hard week because I have 12 potential facts or spins. Oh my right gosh. Now. That's so many. <laughs> I knew you'd find a lot about Drake. This man is unbelievable. We're not going to have time to go through all of them. So I will save the six we don't get to and maybe turn them into spins for future artists or save them in case we ever come back to Drake. That's wild. 12. You, you found 12 things about Drake. Well, I have 12 here, we'll put it this way. Every single fact I'm giving you this week is there's no pure spins. Everything I have is steeped in some bit of Drake trivia. Awesome. That's going to make it... Even if they turn out to be spins. That's really exciting because I like learning things. You know, sometimes when they're just all spins, it kind of feels like a wash because I don't learn anything new. But if they're all a little true, that makes them really hard. But it also means we get to find out a bunch of weird stuff. Yeah. Where to begin? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Should I pick a number one through 12? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> oh, let me pick a track from the first half of the record. Ugh. Disc one has 12 songs. Let's go with nonstop. I'm feeling like I'm, I'm nonstop right now. Let's do it. Fact number two. He was sued by a venue. Okay. Not unheard of, but weird. What venue sued him? Big venue, small venue. Hang on. I have a lot of tabs open, dude. All these facts. Oh, no. <laughs> Aha, I found it. Well, it was part of the America's Most Wanted tour he did with Lil Wayne, Soulja Boy, and Jeezy. Okay. And it was at the, oh gosh, of course, how am I going to pronounce this? Susquehanna Bank Center? Okay, that was good. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? Yeah, okay. 
Did the venue sue everybody that was on that ticket or just Drake? No, just Drake. Wow. Was it something that he did publicly on stage during the show or was it something he like did backstage? Yeah, it was pretty public on stage. Yeah, oh, yeah. no. What'd he do? Fell off it. Oh, he fell off the stage and they <laughs> sued him for it? Yep. That's not how that usually works. Did he damage something by falling off the stage? Uh, yeah. What gave him grounds for a lawsuit? Grounds for Drake is grounds for a lawsuit. <laughs> yeah, he definitely hurt something. Broke something. Someone? Uh, no. Himself. He tore his ACL. Okay. So that's all that broke. And they sued him? Did he swear or something when he did it? But He's Drake. Nope. Okay. What on earth happened? They sued him for breach of contract. Breach of... Was he, like, not able to finish the show? That he was contractually obligated to finish? No. I don't understand. In the contract, they explicitly stated that none of the artists were supposed to get within two feet of the edge of the stage for safety precautions. For exactly that. Yeah, and so he broke that, got too close to the stage, and fell off it, and so they sued him. Okay. <laughs> so is this, like, the first and only time he ventures past that two-foot perimeter, or... Was he, like, flaunting it and... I don't know. I don't bit know. bit the dust. Okay. I didn't see him fall. I wasn't there. <laughs> no, but wow. What if you were? What do they sue him for? Breach of contract. Like, what's he on the hook for here? I don't know. Who who wins? Does it was he... settled out of court. Obviously, it's settled out of court. He probably just gave him $100 million and was like, get off my case. <laughs> well, I bet no one else has gone close to the edge of the stage since then. What, 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 wasn't it his <laughs> own stage? This is a tour they're doing, right? Weren't they traveling with their stage? Probably. I mean, I, I assume it's like a safety policy that they have to agree to. Exactly. So if, if anything, my guess would be it's a preventative thing so that like they can't be sued or something by yeah, Drake. Not if we sue him first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> You can't sue me. I sue you. I can't begin to understand. I'm not a lawyer. I'm a dastard. Yeah. Well, some might say they're the same. <laughs> uh, okay. So this is obviously steeped in truth, as you say. So I think I'm going to say that this one is a full-fledged fact. It's funny that I picked nonstop to be the number of this fact, and it's all about Drake stopping and falling off the stage and getting injured. He sure did stop falling when he hit the ground. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I'm going to say this is a fact. I'm going to lock it in that Drake really did get too close to the stage and fall off. Oh, but did he really get sued? I guess that's the whole point of it. Yeah, I think so. Sure. If nothing else, maybe they did it for the publicity. And he did breach his contract, if that's what it said. This is a spin. Oh, no. <laughs> a spin, really? He did fall off a stage. I don't know which one. And did tear his ACL and have to have surgery. He was not sued. And it was during the America's Most Wanted tour in 2009. Darn. But I don't know what venue or any wasn't sued. Shoot. I knew you were going to ask which venue. And so I specifically went and looked up a list of all the tour dates and locations for that tour. Wow. So I'd have one and then it took me forever to find it. Excellent work though, <laughs> I, I suppose. Yeah, it would be a little ridiculous for them to sue him. That was just on the cusp. Yeah, when you started going down the path of, wait, it was their stage. Why would they? I was like, oh, get him off of that. Get him off of that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know why I believe that all the way. But it was right on the cusp of being ridiculous enough that, of course, it's untrue. And, of course, it has to be true. It walked that line. Well, I'm upset. So we'll go for that as the next fact. <laughs> What's number six? Number six has to wait for the B-side. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> number six, I promised fans would find out on the B-side. So we have to skip number six. Okay, well, for skipping number six, <laughs> let's elevate to number three. Oh, okay. He had a re-bar mitzvah. I know you're probably talking about having a bar mitzvah for a second time, but I'm thinking of like rebar the metal <laughs> poles used to like support concrete. And I'm thinking about like just rebar having a bar mitzvah, <laughs> like a rebar mitzvah. <laughs> That's where my brain went when you said that. Anyway, are you talking about what do you, a second bar mitzvah? Are you talking about a re-space bar mitzvah? Re-dash bar space mitzvah yeah okay right thank you for punctuating that yeah you're welcome why what happened to the first bar mitzvah did it not go well no i'm sure it went fine he just wanted a second one yeah did he like mature a second time isn't that what a bar mitzvah is all about like growing into yeah bar mitzvahs when a boy turns 13 yeah the signal becoming a man right drake didn't turn 13 twice no but he did turn 31 he did 13 backwards so it'd be like a reverse bar mitzvah I don't even want to pronounce that word backwards, but yeah. So, so he had a bar mitzvah when he turned 13 backwards. Hoves, hoves them. Impressive. Hoves them. Now I'm going to take that audio clip and play it in reverse <laughs> and everyone will hear how close you were. Hoves them. Well, that was just mitzvah. You didn't do the bar. Uh, I didn't do the bar the first time. I've just been trying to say mitzvah. That's, I figured the bar part was easy. Okay. Hoves them, Rob. Rob. <laughs> 
the bar mitzvah. <laughs> I'm guessing that's going to be pretty far off, but noble <laughs> attempt. Why does he decide he wants a second bar mitzvah? Because he's Drake and because he can? Uh, Can he? Is there precedent for this? Yeah, I don't really I don't really know why. I think it was just an excuse to party. It was his birthday. and I don't know if Drake needs an excuse to party. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's so special about it? It was a pretty, pretty big party. Sure. You only have one second bar mitzvah. Leading up to the event, Drake hinted at the impending party by posting uh, on Instagram a photo of of his original bar mitzvah and it had a star-studded guest list leonardo dicaprio Haley baldwin madison beer jamie fox toby mcguire kelly Rowland, and more wow that is rather studded with stars it always seems like and more is it everything you always hear about them doing stuff he also passed out red solo cups to everybody that said aubrey's rebar mitzvah inscribed on and they were like custom red solo cups mm -hmm. went by his first name for it interesting boy this is tough is there anything else I need to know about this? Need to know? No. Would like to know about this? Uh, I'm sure there's a lot you'd like to know, but that's all I got. Oh, okay. Well, then that's all I can know anyway. I think this one's a spin. What about it makes you think it's a spin? I just don't see why he wouldn't just throw a birthday party. I don't understand the concept of like turning 31 and doing a reverse bar mitzvah. It's not really reverse, but like even it's just a second one. I don't know. Sure. I just think it's a spin. I'm not feeling it. Fair enough. Which is probably why it's true. Oh, I need you to lock in an answer. I think this feels too much like a spin. Suspiciously so. Oh, so you're going to say true. So I'm going to lock in that it's a fact. Wow. Mm-hmm. Playing the system. No, I'm trying to play the system. I don't know if it's working. I don't know if I am playing the system or if the system is playing me. Okay, so we're officially going with fact. Yeah, I'm officially going with fact. But you think it's a spin. Oh, yeah. I feel like this is not true. So you think I was clever enough to come up with rebar mitzvah being the inverse of 13? I could see it. I'll take that. Yeah. This is... A true fact. Oh, I knew it. Kind of in a weird roundabout way. <laughs> I was right about it, even though I guess I didn't know it. You were right about it, even though you were wrong about it. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and that's a, sometimes the way it is. And I was really happy when you said spin, and then you went and played the system on me. Apologies. So he really did the 1331 thing. Yeah. We'll have to redo Scorpion on episode 741 instead of 147, <laughs> just to like pay tribute to that. Yeah, sure. What's next? What's next? Well, we were nonstop with number two. We elevated to number three. Number three. I think it's God's plan that we jumped to number five. Number five? Yeah. What fact you got? He broke the record for the... Well, just say he broke a record. Well, in case you <laughs> missed, I know you weren't here for the first part of the episode, but I did talk extensively about like 48 records that Drake broke. Okay. You know what? You know, we can do better than that. <laughs> he broke an alcohol record that's one i didn't mention what kind of alcohol records are there just out in the world most expensive bottle oldest bottle and apparently most bottles sold on its opening day oh drake broke a sales record of alcohol yeah so he made his own alcohol yeah drake hall drake <laughs> i'm a heavy draker <laughs> yes he sure did what's it called virginia black okay what kind of alcohol is that like a whiskey whiskey yeah what's it taste like whiskey <laughs> okay well, last time you <laughs> talked about alcohol in the show you said it tasted like crabs so just thought i'd ask it's not crab whiskey virginia black is a personally selected collection of two three and four year old bourbon whiskey focused on a high rye content and finished with a decadent profile Ooh, i do love a decadent profile it is 80 proof 80 proof you're telling me that no 80s can drink that <laughs> anyway sorry that's a stupid joke why virginia does he have ties to virginia He's a Toronto guy. It's a collaboration between Brent Hawking and Drake. Okay. So maybe a situation where he slaps his name on someone's product. Yes. Brent Hawking is the founder of De Leon Tequila and Virginia Black Whiskey. What's the record? I mean, we've talked about what the alcohol is, but what's the record that it broke? Most bottles sold on its launch day. Right. But how many bottles is that? I guess I was unclear. Oh, sorry. <laughs> like yeah. what? Well, let's play... A new spin oh a game gosh. show. I hope this is a one-off. Guess that bottle amount. Gross. <laughs> it's a bit derivative of other game shows, but you know, I'm running out of ideas here. 99 bottles of Virginia Black Forest on the wall. 99 bottles of Drake. Take one down. Sell it in town. 98 bottles of Drake. <laughs> I think it sold 
man, single day, like launch day alcohol records. How many people do you think yep. bought like Bud Light on launch day? I, I like, I don't know. Look how many people stream his records on launch day. I'm going to have to start with a number around 300 million. Whoa, bottles? Of whiskey? Yeah, this is showing you don't know anything about alcohol. <laughs> I don't know how many people would buy it. How, where where was it distributed? Was this internationally rolled out or was it only available from one distillery? Like, this isn't like, I know you use like Bud Light as your example or whatever you said, but like this isn't like, you can't go out and buy a, a 48 pack or something like that. Like these no. are expensive, like whiskey is expensive. Yeah. And you buy one bottle and it lasts a while. You think 300 million? How, we didn't get into the distribution of it. In one day? We didn't get into the distribution of it. In one day? No, I don't, how, was it a nationwide rollout? International? Like, well, let's see. I don't know where all it was rolled out, but I know currently it's available. It's distributed in the U.S. by Proximo Spirits, and it's available in Canada, the U.K., Ghana, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, Zanzibar, Uganda, and the United Arab Emirates. Okay, so you just listed like 12 countries, and you don't think... Oh, also Australia. 13 countries. But that's where it's available now. I doubt it launched there. I don't know, <laughs> but if he's launching it in like Emirates and stuff, I bet Drake has a lot of rich fans that wouldn't mind paying a lot for a bottle they're going to drink for a long time. I don't know. Look, his albums get more than 700 million streams in a day. And I know that's different and stuff, but I'm just saying the dude's got a big fan base. Whiskey has a big fan base. I'm just saying it was a huge number you named. Like that was wild. What's the number? <laughs> What's the record? I don't know what the previous record is. I had no context for that guess, except for the number of fans that Drake has. No, yeah. I'm just saying that was a wild number. 1,779 bottles on its opening day. That's it? Yeah. That's what the record was? I don't know what the record was. That's what it is. Because that record can't be for all alcohol. Was that a whiskey-specific record? Because you just framed it as bottles of alcohol. On opening day, first day ever on the market, 1,779 bottles. Right. Well, uh, this isn't all bottles. What? What, what, what's the, what's, uh, what was the record again? Is it specifically for bottles of whiskey or is it for bottles of alcohol? For whiskey. Okay. I don't think you said that at first. <laughs> I feel like I did. I thought you just said he broke the record for the most bottles of alcohol. I, 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 for the title was alcohol because i wanted to, you to find out it was whiskey but boy have i ever found that out heck that still that's a huge number in one day again um, a whiskey that's never existed on the market before sold that many bottles in one day yeah but in like imagine putting out a product that never existed before and selling 1779 of them in 24 hours that's not that unbelievable that's like tickle me elmo numbers that's <laughs> pretty unbelievable <laughs> it also went on to sell 4650 bottles in its first week and over 30,000 cases in its first year well, I don't know what to do about this. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm going to say it's a fact. I don't know. I have no <laughs> idea. I have no frame of reference for this. You also have very little, like, again, is it U.S. sales records? Is it international? I don't know. I'm just getting very defensive about what apparently was a bad guess for a whiskey sold in 13 countries worldwide by one of the most famous musicians on the planet. I just, when you said 300 million in one day, that blew my mind. There's 8 billion <laughs> people here. Yeah. Still, it's a lot. It's a big number. It's not that inconceivable to think someone will pick up two or three, you know, all the big wig spenders in Dubai. I'm thinking if Drake put out like a t-shirt, there's no way 300 million of his fans buy that shirt on his opening day. It depends. And you think something less universally accepted as t-shirts sold that many? <laughs> Like, I don't know. It just It seemed like a wild number. I thought you were going to be way over it because it was a low number, but I didn't expect you to be up at 300 million. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything. I know elevators. You know what else you don't know? You're probably going to say that this is a spin. That's probably where you're leading with that. You don't know if this is a fact or not. I don't. I think it is, but... I locked in fact. Yeah, well, I think I think it's a fact. I think you're right. Do you not know? This started as a spin. I saw you had a whiskey thing. I was like, oh, I'll make up a... Like, that he broke a record. And so then I went and found a bunch of other sources about Virginia Black Whiskey. And I'm just now noticing partway into this fact, uh, when I went to reference their Wikipedia page. Like, just now? Just now. That it says Virginia Black sold a record 1,779 bottles. Whoa! I don't know if that means it actually broke a record or <laughs> or not. So you made up something actually true. Maybe. 
I don't know if it actually broke a record or not. <laughs> it's just the Wikipedia that says, you know, Wikipedia, not a reliable source, can't cite it. It says Virginia Black sold a record 1,779 bottles. And I discovered that halfway into the fact when I was <laughs> giving you more information about it. I expected this to be a spin. I was going to make up a ludicrous number. Found these numbers on the Wikipedia page when looking where it was distributed. And now I see it has the word record, which concerns me. Well, I just guess if it sold a record, I think that's... That's a fact, and that's... I don't know if it's a fact or not. <laughs> I'll have to do some more research. For now, we'll give it to you, but I might be stripping you at that point in a future episode. Okay. Also, Virginia Black has the most annoying website ever. <laughs> really? Not a sponsor. Here you go. Here's the website. Okay. Yes, I am 21 years of age. Don't remember me. Oh, it's one of these, huh? Did it do the thing for you? What thing? Now it wants to know my location. <laughs> Otherwise, it seems fine. Oh, wait. Sorry. I take that I take that back, Virginia Black. You don't have the most annoying website either. It's just, just poorly designed because I have to do this weird scrolly thing. The scrolly thing is normal. Yeah. We'll get to the most annoying website. <laughs> Will we? <laughs> well, we might, depending on what numbers you pick. Actually, I know for a fact it'll come back up, actually. Wow. I can't even buy or drink it here. In the U.S.? It is so unavailable. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, there we go. That's a weird one. What number do you want next? I don't know. I'm upset again, but I still can't pick number six. We got one left for the normal cut. Let's go with Sandra's Rose, number 10. He produced a hit show. Nice. He starred and produced in a hit show is probably the better catchy title. Okay. Really, I should just make it he starred in a show, but I already told you he produced as well. That was <laughs> sure. going to be that was gonna be something I revealed partway into it, but... Well, we are kind of partway into it. We were just a really early part into it when you said it. <laughs> yeah. I, re I should have said he starred in the show and then revealed that he also produced it. Well, we all know, if there's one thing I remember from the beginning of this episode, so it's the Drake starred in the hit teen drama Degrassi. Sure did. Is that what this fact is about? Oh, absolutely not. I was just agreeing with the fact that that happened. Okay, well, you said sure did in a way that kind of implied that, like, it was leading to something. Oh, my bad. What's the other show? What other shows is he in? I guess I'm not too familiar with, you know, television generally. Oh, it's just a show called Top Boy. T Top Boy? Mm-hmm. I've never heard of this. Yeah, you, you might not have. I mean, I don't know. Do you not keep up on the hot shows on the UK Netflix? No, it's a UK Netflix exclusive? Yeah. No, I do not keep up with UK Netflix, seeing as how I am in the much alphabetically subsequent US. Hmm. What's Top Boy? Is it like Beyblades where you, you know, fight tops? <laughs> I like that. It's kind of reminding me of like Fallout in the Pip Boy, but it's just Drake giving a thumbs up. Top Boy is a British crime drama television series. Answer me this before you say another word. Does Drake do a British accent? Absolutely. Maybe. It's possible. <laughs> okay. There's absolutely a chance he does. I've not seen the show. But he stars in it. He is the top boy. Yeah, yeah, he's the top boy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but what... But that should have been... Shoot, that would have been a great title, in fact. Drake is a top boy. <laughs> yeah, that would have been awesome. So... What what does he do? Is it a crime? What, what did you say the show? Yeah, the series is set in the fictional Summerhouse Estate in the London borough of Hackney. It focuses on two drugs dealers, Deshane, played by Ashley Walters, and Sully, originally played by Kane Robinson. Originally played? Along with others involved with drug dealing and gang violence in London. Does Drake replace the originally played guy? He sure does. Interesting. Why? What happens to original guy? Oh, gee. He dies in between when the show was originally canceled and when Drake revived it. Drake himself. That's how he gets to produce the show is he watches it, loves it, probably kills the guy and says, I want to play that part. <laughs> And then brings the show back from the almost literal dead. Dang. I'm speculating, just like theoretically. Yeah, well, most of everything you just said there was accurate. Wow. <laughs> yeah, Drake became a massive fan of Top Boy when he was on tour over in the UK. Mm. And he was very disappointed when Channel 4 canceled the show after its second season. Wow. Two seasons of a British TV show is like 18 years apart. Season 1 was in 2011. Or sorry, as the British call it, Series 1 was mm -hmm. in 2011 and series two was in 2013 drake revived it for series three in 2019 oh big gap is it still running no it concluded with its fifth series in 2023 so it's just recently gone off the air and drake stuck with it the whole time acting producing the whole nine yeah yep 2019 2022 and 2023 were series three four and five what's he do in the show just as a character is it like action is it like detective 
Is he dealing drugs? Well, he's one of the drug dealers, right? He it focuses on two drug dealers, the Shane and Sully. So yeah, does he like just go up to people in a trench coat on the street corner? I don't know. They're like the two main characters, so I don't know. I haven't seen the show. I don't really know what they do. It's like British Breaking Bad, right? You know, that's probably what would be an accurate description. Having never seen it, that's what it feels like. Knowing nothing about it, that's got to be exactly. I, it. Yeah. Well, I'm like skimming. I'm skimming through the plot summaries, and I don't want to give any spoilers for anybody who might want to go check the show out no but it looks like looking at some of the things that happen in here where it's like this character does this right it feels like a british breaking bad okay i think this is a proper spin proper spin yeah i think you've taken some show that i've never heard of which is not hard to do okay and uh maybe drake likes it maybe drake doesn't even know about it maybe he was in an episode Maybe he produced it but didn't star in it. I think there's a lot of points of failure for this. Sure. Just keep in mind that at least some detail of what I've told you so far is true. That's also a good point. And that limits down some of those possibilities. But... Yeah, but that could be as little as Drake discovered this show while he was on tour in the UK and liked it. <laughs> so born from truth doesn't necessarily mean much. Fair I think I'm still going to say this is a spin. Lock it in. Okay. This is a spin. Oh, yeah. But only because. If I'd known you were going to be this skeptical of it, I wouldn't have changed my intro statement because he didn't star in it. He only executively Whoa. produced it. <laughs> the thing that you meant to say but didn't say yeah. and then accidentally added back in. Yeah. Wow. I was right, too. I caught on to that. I was like, he could have produced it and not starred in it. Yeah. He executively produced it and was the reason it got brought back. That's why he's an executive producer. That means he doesn't really have to do any of the work. Well, he could have, but he chose not to. Uh, we didn't get into that with your questioning but when he decided he wanted to try to bring the show back he met up with the show's creator and writer ronan bennett to discuss a revival plan they came to an agreement about their path forward and pitched it to netflix and netflix signed a deal in under an hour of their pitch whoa look this is drake he sells hundreds of millions of bottles of whiskey you want him <laughs> on your team rather than directing or acting in the show drake worked as an executive producer and mainly in the role of promoting the show. Yep. Leading the marketing and creative team. That's kind of what I figured. You know, if he likes the show. He he chose to rehire all of the show's original writers and leave the show writing and direction to them. That's what I was thinking. If he really loves the show, probably a hands-off creative yep. approach is like a fun way that you can play a part in it and still experience it like a fan. Yeah. One of his songs actually also appears on the soundtrack. And to promote the revival, Drake dropped a freestyle rap called Behind Bars with a Z on the music promotional platform Link Up TV and then did not officially release the track yet, let people like it, right? And then released it on the soundtrack to help promote the show. Interesting. Wow. That's pretty good. Behind Bars gained over 40 million streams prior to its release on the soundtrack. That's how much attention he brought. Oh my gosh. He's an attention machine. We're doing it too. We're a part of it. Yep. Well, that's a pretty strong start. I'm excited to see what you got on the B side. It's been teased a few times, <laughs> but you'll have to jump over to spinitpod.com if you're listening to the normal cut to hear the rest. Otherwise, goodbye, mixtaper. And until then, yeah. There he goes, away into the fog. Welcome back, Connor. Thanks. You're welcome. I Welcome back, you're welcome. Oh, I don't uh, Yeah. <laughs> I feel like welcoming you back kind of implies that you are welcome to be here. Yeah. But then you're welcome. Hmm. Best not to think about it. Let's talk about the album cover of Scorpion. Honestly, I have so little to say about it. It's Drake. He signed his name. Looks like he signed his actual name. Not Drake. It looks like he signed Aubrey Graham. He didn't sign Champagne Poppy? No, he did not sign Champagne Poppy. Even though Champagne Poppy's the one that made the album. It's also like a grainy black and white compared to the other, I don't know, black and white album covers we've talked about. Like Florence and the Machine... That was crisp. This one's a little fuzzy. Fuzzy like Drake. Yeah, like his haircut. Well, let's get into it. We got 25 tracks to talk about if you're listening to the B-side. Less than that if you're not. It's a long album. Who boy. But up first is Survival, an international top 20 hit. In the U.S., it entered and peaked at number 17, and it was on the chart for two weeks. In Canada, it got to number 18, and it samples a 1980 song by Claude Larson called Telex. I like all the fourth wall breaks that drake puts into survival i mean he does it a lot more in other spots on the album but right off the bat you know he's like i've been waiting on this all the way down to 
the very end of the song, like, this is just the intro, let me not get ahead of myself, he kind of walks us through his career and all these significant moments of his life, the feuds, the collaborations, all this disorder, no addressing, like, this album is him addressing it, and he lays it all out right from the start of Survival. And of course, the first disc is the rap disc, right? <laughs> we gotta know which one you liked more. Well, I can't give you all the stuff at the beginning. I'll have nothing left for Final Spin. No, I know. I'm just reminding you. I mean, Survival starts the rap part of the album no to be fair almost the whole album is the rap part of the album but yeah drake does a lot more rapping but you talked about how like wiz khalifa does a lot more singing i think drake is prone to a little singing too not on the first track no not on survival he pretty much raps the whole thing the music's interesting on survival yeah i know it almost reminds me of like handheld video game music beeps and boops and blings yeah and just a very slow subtle synth line there that ba, ba. just being there ever present but not in your face mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting how many times the music on this album kind of is not in your face while drake's lyrics are very <laughs> confrontational to put it <laughs> In, in a way. Sure. His lyrics are very in your face sometimes, but the music is often kind of dialed back. And I really loved, actually, some of the lyrics that I started hearing in Survival. I think the lyric that really set the tone for me for the rest of this album is when he says, my Mount Rushmore is me with four different expressions. That really piqued my interest. I can't tell if he means that in like a hilarious way that it is very funny or if he's like serious about it. I can't tell what attitude he's approaching that with, but I think that's an excellent line. I think some of Drake's lyrics can be a little bland, right? We've got two hours of rap here, and he largely talks about himself and his life. And so it gets a little repetitive sometimes, but there are a lot, a lot of diamonds buried in that rough. I think his songs are kind of like an M&M cookie, okay? Hear me out. Okay. The cookie itself is fine. It's just another cookie. But he puts so many fun little phrases and jokes and quips and sounds into the song, right? Little M&Ms into his cookie to make it a really, really nice cookie. I like the cookie part of the M&M cookie. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But it's just a cookie. It's a good cookie, but it's just a cookie. Yeah. He takes the cookie to another level with all the M&Ms. Fair enough. I think it's an okay opener. It's a good tone setter for at least the first disc of this really, really long album. Yeah. What about Nonstop? I actually, I think Nonstop, I, I like it a million times better than Survival. He just flipped a switch, you know? Still no singing. Not really. No. I mean, he does have kind of a penchant for, like, really almost monotone kind of rapping. In a certain sense, it's singing because he's able to hold his voice at a certain intonation. Well, that's what all rapping is. What? <laughs> you could argue that us talking right now is in some sense singing because we have a cadence and a flow to our voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get cadence, but I'm talking about he's able to maintain such a flat line delivery. Yeah. yeah. It's, I don't know. It's like singing, but there's no note. <laughs> that he's hitting so yeah like so if i talk in a monotone talk with no inflection i'm singing you're what i'm saying is you're working to keep your voice at that level sure but that doesn't mean it's singing i think the definition's ambiguous <laughs> when i yell because i'm excited i'm working to give my voice a certain inflection but i'm not singing people scream that's singing it can be i don't know it's semantics but he doesn't sing on this song you're right no <laughs> <laughs> people called non-stop one of the album's best songs right off the bat even now even today five six years later i still hear it played out and about it was actually the album's most streamed song during his first week with almost 9.3 million streams peaked at number one in canada and in the top 10 in eight different countries around the world also interesting the music video for non-stop spent a week as an Apple Music exclusive. It was also his first ever documentary style music video, which he's continued to explore in the future. Mm, haven't seen it. No, I haven't either. But I have seen a few of the little TikTok style flip the switch challenges. People did a lot of those. Little kind of dance TikTok challenge that was inspired by nonstop. In premise, nonstop is pretty simple. He lives his life nonstop. Never ends. Even beyond the scope of his music, his businesses, his money, it keeps on going. It's a Roly, not a stopwatch, which is kind of clever. Does Rolex make stopwatches, do you think? Frankly, I've never looked into it. One moment. <laughs> they sure do. They sure do. So it can be a Roly and a stopwatch, but I guess that defeats the whole point of the song. Hang on, I might have prematurely said they do. On Rolex forums, I thought I saw... Oh yeah, no, this is real. Is it real? Rolex... Comptour stopwatch. One in stock, it's $3,000. 
I will not be purchasing. It's from 1910. Whoa. Sold in Sri Lanka? Yeah, okay. So, no. I mean, yes, they did make stopwatches. It, it can be a Rolly and a stopwatch. But unlike Drake, they stopped. Yeah, I'm on Rolex's website. Search stopwatch. Didn't get anything. No. I bet they get a lot of inquiries. Actually, the song came about because producer Tay Keith sent Drake the beat after they had connected on Instagram. And they had actually worked together a few times before. This particular song, it was a later addition to Scorpion. And it was kind of meant to have a very Memphis-inspired sound and feel to it. Keith said, It was one of those records I didn't expect it to be as big as it was. He said he just cooked it up in a pack and saw where it went. Drake hopped on it. And I didn't expect it to be at number two on the Billboard Hot 100. It wasn't made for anything specific. It was a random type of blessing. And a billion streams on Spotify. That's pretty blessed. It really doesn't stop. Until you get to about 3 minutes and 58 seconds. Then it stops. And we start elevating into Elevate. I like to Elevate. You did? Still no singing, but I really enjoyed the music of this one. Yeah. I think the music's great. And honestly, I've kind of, I like the production on Nonstop a lot too. The beat was really good. Yeah. And I think that's honestly one of the album as a whole's biggest strengths is its production and its choices of instrumentation and stuff. Let me ask you something. Go ahead. Do you know the song Emotion by Mariah Carey? No. Oh. I only know one Mariah Carey song. Oh, yeah? Is it Vision of Love? No. Oh. Well, Mariah Carey sings a song called Emotion. And if you did know that song, you might have started listening to Emotionless and said, Oh, I recognize this song as the club remix of Mariah Carey's Emotion. Because it is. Really? Yeah, it samples that. But this one's Emotionless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he samples it and takes all the emotion right out of it. But yeah, she and her co-writers get some co-writing credits on this song. Mariah said she was very flattered by the use of her sample. And when Emotionless cracked the U.S. Top 10, it became Mariah's 25th Top 10 single in America. Which I think is always interesting, isn't it? Like, that counts towards your stats? I mean, I guess it should. 25 Top 10 singles is so many. <laughs> That's a lot. It's too many. Congratulations, Mariah Carey. All I want for Christmas is a pony. You want a pony? Sure. Noted. No. Let's see here. No! Where to buy a pony? Emotionless is a wild song. I do believe that it was the first time Drake acknowledged the existence of his son, Adonis. There were rumors swirling about it previously. Ooh, here's a match finder for people looking for horses and people looking to sell horses. Oh, cute. It's like a dating app, but for horses. Equestrianmingle.com. <laughs> but this is the first time Drake addresses kid speculators head on. He says, I wasn't hiding my kid from the world. I was hiding the world from my kid. Fair enough. Yeah, it's a pretty nuanced kind of take. I actually was impressed with that one. I like Emotionless. I really like, honestly, I really like Mariah Carey's backtracks on this. Yeah, I didn't realize it was Mariah Carey, but it's cool. It's kind of a long song. You know, that's the thing is, it's, yeah, 25 tracks long album. We've been over it. But most of the tracks are like three minutes, two and a half minutes. Like, it goes by quickly. Emotionless does not. It is five minutes. And it is the second longest song on the album. Yeah. Which is interesting. And maybe it kind of drags on a little bit long. But the payoff when Emotionless finally comes to an end and we switch into God's Plan is immense. Wow. God's Plan is the song from the record, I think. I mean, one of the top two, definitely. But God's Plan felt like 2018's mega hit. Really? Didn't make its way to me. Couldn't have been that mega. I don't necessarily consider you the be-all and the end-all of what pop music was. I'm just saying, if it made it to me, you know it, it really stood out. That's true, and I guess it didn't make it to you. But it made it to you now. Does it stand out from these first five tracks? Or maybe all 25? I'd put it in my top three. Ooh, early of reveal of the, the Connor first... top three. No, 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 no. You know, let me finish the sentence. In my top three of the first five. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, sorry, survival. Sorry, nonstop. Am I right? I can neither confirm nor deny your rightness. Okay. Well, then that means I'm right. Now, I don't... That th means I'm upset. <laughs> Not yet, you're not. Oh. <laughs> this is the, I said this is the mega hit from the album. I've got more to say about it. If you can believe it, 
I can't even believe it. God's Plan was actually the 29th song in history to debut at number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Really? 29 songs have done that. Feels like it should be more. Yeah, it's more now. But at the time of God's Plan, that's all there was. I just feel like it should have been more by then, too. Yeah, I know. It's unbelievable. It was Drake's fourth American number one. It also peaked on top of the charts in 14 countries worldwide. And when it came out, it alone i mean we talked about how scorpion did it as an album but god's plan alone broke first day streaming records on apple and spotify although again i think they've since been surpassed it had 14 million streams on apple and even before it was scorpion's lead single it was a part of drake's little scary hours ep god's plan's been nominated for more than two dozen awards and it's won a hip-hop song of the year and Best Music Video Director at the iHeart Music Awards, a BET Award for Video of the Year, and a Grammy for Best Rap Song. So this is the best rap song of 2018, officially, legally speaking. Critics called it very catchy, but also said it was very Drakey, right? Very similar to a lot of the things that Drake does. Like a lot of Drake songs, it started with a beat and an instrumental, and Drake wanted a bouncy vibe, he said for God's plan, and he got it. God's plan was bouncy. That's right, like a bounce castle or a trampoline. Ooh, where to buy a bounce house? Probably you should just rent one. <laughs> the song's all about how even though people want to drag Drake down and see him fail, he's still gonna succeed because success for Drake is God's plan. It was allegedly supposed to have a feature from Trippy Red, but apparently he did not get his verse finished fast enough and he got dropped from one of the biggest songs, I mean, of the decade in rap. A real shame that. In the music video for God's Plan, Drake went around Miami giving away hundreds of thousands of dollars to strangers. He just walked up to people with a wad of cash and gave them money. By 2020, the video had 1.2 billion views and it was the 31st most liked video on all of YouTube. Since then, it's really slowed down and it's only up to 1.5 billion in the four years since. But that's pretty significant. Mm. I like God's Plan a lot. It's in the regular rotation. How you feeling? I'm upset. Nice. Teed that one up pretty well for you, I think. I'm upset was not very well loved critically. Critics called it boring. Pitchfork said Drake doesn't switch up his flow. The minimal beat drones on. And we're asked to take the rap song with the chanted chorus, I'm upset with a straight face. I'm upset is not self-expression. It's what you teach a toddler to howl instead of pulling someone's hair. <laughs> That's a pretty scathing review. I didn't quite get that vibe from it, but it definitely is kind of a return to form. God's plan in Emotionless broke us out of it a little bit. I'm upset is like right back to elevate level. It's about alimony and people who are, you guessed it, out to get him after Drake. Kind of a real persecution complex on this album. I don't know if you picked up on it, but I also don't know how you could have missed it. What'd you think? Do you like I'm Upset better? You like it worse? You like it in the middle? I like the middle. Okay. I kind of like the little droning background of it. Yeah, I, the bass beat was really good. And like I really like the way it hit every time. Mm -hmm. There was so much space between like some of his lyrics and between some of the big instrumental hit. Like I don't know, it just felt airy as a song. It does. And I was I wasn't into it. No, I get that. And I think the very programmed drums kind of wear you down on I'm Upset a little bit. It's like aggressively synthetic. <laughs> also, the music video for I'm Upset features more than a dozen of Drake's Degrassi co-stars in a fake high school reunion. If you remember nothing else from this episode, if you take away no other thing, remember Drake was in Degrassi. <laughs> what would you rate I'm Upset as on a scale of 10? Uh, what do you mean by that? I mean, just like as a song, oh, oh. how's it do? Oh, well, I said I liked it a medium amount, so we'll say like a six out of 10. Okay, six out of 10, not bad. Mm -hmm. What score would you give the next song out of 10? Easy, easy score. Eight out of 10. Eight out of 10 gets an eight out of 10? Wow. I think you just said that for the joke, but I'm going to run with it. I absolutely did. <laughs> One of your favorite songs on the album? Wow. Eight out of 10. The title, eight out of 10, people speculate may be a reference to the fact that Scorpion was Drake's eighth album in 
the span of 10 years, mm. which I think makes a lot of sense to me because I can't really see too many other reasons that it would be called 8 out of 10. Not like he made it the eighth track on the album would have been, I mean, a really <laughs> smart, easy thing to do. <laughs> but then he would have only had that 10 tracks. 8 out of 25 does not hit the same. Yeah, <laughs> it really doesn't. No. I didn't like the ending of 8 out of 10. Oh, no? The little skit? Yeah. That can go. Of course it can. I'm not surprised by that. <laughs> That's what drags it down. That's it? It could have been an 8 out of 10 for me. No, it couldn't have. No, I actually kind of liked it. Really? Compared to some of the other ones in the first 8. Okay. 7. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> in, the first, in the first 7. <laughs> no, I do, I do think the end could go. Definitely. There's really no need for it. No need at all. I do like 8 out of 10, and I think maybe it's a little underrated. Up next, actually 8 out of 25 is Mob Ties. Mob Ties was the seventh single. It spent 13 weeks on the Canadian Hot 100, peaking at number 11, and it was on the U.S. Hot 100 for eight weeks with a peak of number 13. It actually somehow ended the year in the 94th position on the year-end U.S. Hot R&B and Hip Hop Songs chart, which is interesting. It samples the 1996 Nas track Affirmative Action, and it's another song, you guessed it, about Drake cutting ties with people who have stabbed him in the back or made their way onto his bad side. He's sick of them, and he wants to hire some help. If you can, you know, wink, wink, hire some help to get rid of them, kill them with his mob ties. Yeah. I think mob ties for me kind of is like the eh, track of this half of the record. Maybe not the worst, but it's in my bottom three of the first 12. I like the little like mouth noisy mix on mob ties. The like little Do I remember <laughs> that? Where's that happen? I have it somewhere in the, probably around the one minute mark. We'll go to the 35 and just listen and you'll hear him do it. Oh yes. Yeah, classic. See, that's what I mean. That's one of those M and M's. Little sound effects. Little little beeps and boops and and weird lyrics and you know, it's all in there. I would describe it more as finding a chocolate chip in your in your raisin cookie. Oh, okay. That's yeah. the whole cookie. Then is worse. Well, but the chocolate chip is a better surprise. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's like you walk up, you see a plate of cookies, like oh, sweet chocolate chip cookies, and you find out they're raisin, and you're a little disappointed. But then you take a bite into one and there's a chocolate chip that breached contamination and made it into the cookie. Sure. Mob ties is eh. Mob ties is all right. It's fine. It would be one that I would consider dropping if I were trying to pare this album down a little bit. Is it over yet? Uh, what? The album? The album's yeah. not over yet. We've still got two more tracks on this half of it. <laughs> <laughs> Time for our first official feature. Got Jay-Z. Yeah. So a lot of these other songs have had uncredited features, but Talk Up is up next, and it does indeed feature Hove. It is not the first time we've talked about Jay-Z, and I guarantee it will not be the last, although it might be the last this episode. It's their first real work together since 2013, but overall, Talk Up is their fifth collaboration. They used to have a little beef. They threw some disses back and forth, but they've since reconciled. Obviously, they were cool at this point. It also features uncredited vocals from rapper Baka Not Nice and a sample from NWA's 1987 song, Dope Man. It hit number 17 on the Canadian charts and spent eight weeks on the charts in the U.S., peaked exactly at number 20. And it's all about Drake's childhood and present success. Always always drake if not about his present then about his enemies if not about his enemies then about his childhood if not about his childhood he'll find something else to talk about about himself it's the drakiest album you could imagine but that's just like his thing you know what i mean i don't mean that in like a super critical way of this album because if you listen to a drake album what did you expect right i don't know i have mixed feelings about it talk up kind of goes a little hard it's got those like dramatic kind of background vocals that sound like I don't know. They're almost reminiscent of like Star Wars and like Duel of the Fates. I don't know about that. Duel of the Fates goes hard. I don't know if I would compare these two. I feel like it emulates that. Bump, bump. Like those vocals, the choir in the background that's just hitting those big dramatic minor intervals. It feels like Drake and Jay-Z should be lightsaber fighting in a volcano. I disagree. In a, sorry, what? Hit me with that one again? Should be lightsaber fighting in a volcano. I understand that's not the context of the original Duel of the Fates song, but they should be doing it in a volcano. Why a volcano? Because that's the vibe of the song. Interesting. I disagree. I don't think it goes nearly as hard. Okay, well, where would you want to see them lightsaber fight? I don't, I don't think they'd be lightsaber fighting. Okay. Maybe they're still in a volcano. Okay, you just want to see them standing in a volcano. Yeah. What do you think about Jay-Z? 
I don't remember the last time we had a Jay-Z feature, but it's happened. I've heard a lot about Jay-Z. Have you? Yeah? Yeah. What have you heard about Jay-Z? What's that mean? I've heard a lot about Jay-Z. Okay. I don't know if I can name a single one of his songs. Not one? How can you not be a Hov fan? I know he's like the richest musician. He sure is. But like a long way. Yeah. He's like stinking rich. He's married to Beyonce. That's right. And we talked about him, I guess, on episode 96. And definitely on episode 3, talked about him faxing Kanye West, which was not true. But what if it was? Heard a lot about him. What'd you think of his feature, though? His voice? Now you've heard him speak and rap. You've heard his music. I I'd heard him speak before. What? <laughs> Talk and rap. Heard his rapping on... Uh... Episode three, right? Wasn't he a feature? Yeah, yeah, he was on Monster. He was on there. I know everything I need to know about Jay-Z, it sounds like. Heard him speak, heard him rap. Well, what'd you think about him here? <laughs> oh, here? Yeah, he's okay. Okay. He could end up being your favorite feature. We'll have to find out. Only time will tell. I have a feeling that won't be true. We'll find out. But we'll see. I know what you're asking yourself. We're on track 12. Is it over or is there more? It is not over. Is there more as far as this album goes? Yes, this is like the halfway point. There's just as much more to the album as there has been so far. But is there more is track 12. It's the closer of disc one, the rap disc. And then we'll move into the R&B disc. This is an interesting pivot. You know, Drake actually doesn't talk about himself directly necessarily. He's kind of talking more about the meaning of life and what his purpose is. Life is more than the things that he says in his songs, but is it? Is there more? That's kind of what he tries to answer in the song, but he never really does. I think he just kind of means to imply, of course there's more. He's like, is there more to life than my job? Is there more to life than going on boats? Like, yes, of course. You know what? What? He's singing on Can't Take a Joke. It took you this long to realize it? No, I just, I, I gotta give credit where credit's due. You know, he's, is it as good of singing, in my opinion, as Elevate? No. Okay. But it is singing, especially when compared to this one. Is there more? He doesn't sing on Is There More, really. No. No, that's what I said. That's what I said. Compared to this one, he's definitely singing on <laughs> Can't Take a Joke. Right. He just, I just, he kills me. The only rest that I do is wear the rest of my commas. I'm just tired. <laughs> tired of hearing about Drake at this point. Not only is this too long of an album, it's just nothing but songs about him. It's so Drakey. It's everything is Drake. Like, I'm so over it already. Yeah. Like, it'd be one thing if you were singing about interesting things. Right. And I mean, Wiz Khalifa's songs were also all about his life. Like, he got criticized for only writing about one or two things. But he did it in a way that was, like, way more engaging, I thought. Yeah, and it wasn't a 20, it wasn't 25 tracks of it. <laughs> Yeah, and it wasn't just him going, hey, I'm Wiz Khalifa. I live like this. This is my life. Here are all the people that hate me. Here are all the people that I hate. I'm Wiz Khalifa. This is how I grew up. This is what I want to do in the future. Every one of my albums is awesome, dude. Like, that's kind of what Drake is doing. Yeah. Boy, oh boy, is there more? As a matter of fact, yes. But the rap disc is done. General thoughts on the rap side? Not done with rap. No. But still... Rap disc is done. Yes, we've kind of made it through the heavily rap influenced songs. And now we get R&B influenced songs. But I do, I do really love Summer Games. I think it's one of the best melodies on the whole album. I really wish Drake did more of the stuff on Summer Games. More singing, more really kind of clever melodies that actually move somewhere. And this song is like about him, but it's about... A heartbreak song you know it's a relationship that he was in that, that failed there's i think on just in general the back half of the album a lot more dimension and depth to it lyrically than there was in the first dozen tracks musically i'm not so sure i think that there's arguments to be made either direction on that but lyrically i really think we've kind of taken a turn for the better on the second half of the album in summer games particularly the relationship ended too soon the relationship ended because it started too soon and he wasn't ready for the level of commitment that she needed from him people have speculated that it's about rihanna who drake's been kind of on again off again with from time to time in the past given that the song features a relationship that's you know starting and ending by the end of the summer it would kind of make sense i like summer games as well yeah there's like a beat to it yes it does he's singing mm -hmm. a lot of singing drake the lyrics were good. I, you know, I was sick and tired of hearing about Drake. I was okay with hearing about Drake on this one. Yeah, because it's not about Drake. It's about Heart Drake. Heart Drake. Get it? Like Heartbreak, <laughs> but Drake's. I really do think Summer Games is a standout track. Even when they do that weird break, 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 break in my heart kind of stutter production at the end. I, I still really like it. And if there weren't so many other songs that I would rather have on the playlist ahead of it, I might take it for my playlist pick. Mm. Wow, but it's so good. 
Just every time I listen to it, we hit that chorus. It's great. And subtle, honestly. A little not in your face, which is such a refreshing change. It's just such a different. Just the second half of the album is such a different style. It is different. And then, like, it's kind of been different. But then we get to Nice For What. Nice For What feels like it could go on the first half of this album just as easily as it ends up here on the back half. It's a late record hit. It was the second single from the album. And Nice For What features vocals from Big Freedia, who you may remember from Beyonce's hit, Break My Soul. Did you, not to put, I guess it's a leading question to phrase it this way, but did you love the samples on Nice For What? Yeah, stop trying to lead me, all right? Uh, objection. Leading the leading witness. The, leading the witness. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Um, did you have opinions on the samples of Nice For What? And how they were the best samples on the album. <laughs> You're doing so good. <laughs> I didn't go to law school. I, I did. I liked them. You're talking about the background vocals? Oh, absolutely. All of it. Yeah. Nice for what is excellent. It's got some very, 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 very layered sampling because directly, okay, follow me down the Russian nesting doll of this. It samples Lauren Hill's song X Factor, right? That's the one that this is built on. But Lauren Hill's song X Factor samples Can It All Be So Simple by the Wu-Tang Clan that we talked about on episode 117. Oh. And then Can It All Be So Simple samples The Way We Were by Barbara Streisand. Oh. So Barbara Streisand wrote a song. The Wu-Tang Clan liked it and sampled that song to make Can It All Be So Simple. Lauren Hill liked Can It All Be So Simple and took that and incorporated it into X Factor. And Drake heard X Factor and liked it so much that he sampled it into Nice For What. I think Drake officially gets to spin it Rush- Russian Nesting Doll Award. Yeah, he does. For this song alone. So all, all of those songwriters get co-writing credits on this track, including all eight members of the Wu-Tang Clan. That's crazy. ODB. ODB. The RZA and the Jizza, Master Killa, Inspector Deck, they all co-wrote <laughs> Nice For What in a certain sense. And Barbara Streisand co-wrote nice for what really weird mix but i love it best sample on the album i'm claiming it putting that flag down is weird and what a hit it debuted at number one in the u.s it actually ousted god's plan from the number one spot and became drake's fifth number one in the country and actually here you know how we were surprised that god's plan was the 29th number one debut in history Mm -hmm. nice for what was the very first time that an artist replaced themselves with a number one debut that's crazy yeah it is it's borderline unbelievable like the what what think about what it takes to do that that means you have to have two number one songs instantly from the same album or just have one there for a really long time well that's true boy that'd be even harder though uh nice for what also topped the charts in canada the uk australia critically they have not been so mean to drake (laughs) On Nice For What. Everyone's kind of been a little nicer towards it, but for what? It's good. I like Nice For What. Me too. Rolling Stone called it the 54th best song of the entire decade. Whoa. Mm Mm-hmm. In 2021, they deemed it Drake's greatest song, which who knew, you know? It earned two ASCAP awards and even a nomination for the Best Rap Performance Grammy, which it actually lost to Kendrick Lamar's King's Dead from the Black Panther soundtrack. Oh, but it's great. Nice for what is a top two playlist pick contender for me. Really? Oh, yeah, it is. It's a song about female empowerment, and he leans into that in the music video. It features more than a dozen notable women in entertainment, including Emma Roberts, Rashida Jones, who's related to Quincy Jones. She's his daughter. You remember Quincy Jones? Never heard of him. Oh, well, she's in it. (laughs) Zoe Saldana's in it. Olivia Wilde's in it. Many, many more. It's a star-studded music video for a, I don't know, star-studded song. It's great. Love it. Nice for what's nice for me. I like nice for what a lot. Oh, me too. It's not so bad. He's just in his feelings. He sure is just in his feelings. I think In My Feelings is the last great moment on this album. It's not the last good moment, but I mean, it's one of Scorpion's best moments overall, In My Feelings is. And it's one of Drake's most iconic moments from the last decade plus, I think. And you didn't know about In My Feelings before this episode? Nope. Wow. I can't believe it. It was huge. 
It was the record's fifth single. Not sure how it wasn't even higher than the fifth single. Maybe they didn't anticipate the meme status of Kiki Do You Love Me. I feel like it got around a lot. It's another song that inspired a dance challenge. A very dangerous, stupid dance challenge where people would dance in oncoming traffic. They would start the song and then ghost ride their cars, right? Get out of their car and let it drive and dance next to it. Like, just unthinkable. People are so stupid. The music video was shot in New Orleans, and the end of it features cameos and snippets of people doing the challenge, or different variants of it, including celebrities like Millie Bobby Brown, Ryan Seacrest, DJ Khaled, Will Smith, even Dua Lipa. Oh, maybe maybe I saw that and didn't realize that was this song. Uh, it's possible. I don't know. How much do you watch viral dance challenges? No, I just, I've seen those, those kind of things just, you know, get recommended to you. Yeah, that's true. In My Feelings debuted at number six in the U.S., but quickly jumped up to number one, making it Drake's sixth number one. It would spend 10 weeks there. It also broke single week streaming records with 116.2 million streams later to be dethroned by Old Town Road by Lil Nas X. Mm, yeah. We talked about that one. We sure did. On It's an episode in the 40s, but I can't remember specifically which one. 42? Was it really back in the 40s? That was in year one? Yeah. That's wild. I know. In My Feelings, though, is still doing okay. It's certified an absurd eight times platinum in the u.s six times platinum in australia five times in canada two times in the uk italy portugal platinum in belgium brazil denmark mexico france new zealand poland spain and sweden all those places i've also i definitely have heard the kiki do you love me thing but i had never heard mm -hmm. the actual song itself that that came from he's been writing say so you'll never ever leave from beside him because he wants you and he needs you and he's down for you always it's great the Kiki in the song refers to Drake's first girlfriend and childhood friend, Kesia Chante. He also references Jennifer Lopez and the rap duo City Girls, who also do some uncredited vocals. It also, wow, get this, In My Feelings also samples Magnolia Shorty's acapella version of Smoking Gun and, and Lollipop by Lil Wayne which we talked about in episode 57. Wow. I know. I think we talked about how weird of a song Lollipop was. But yeah, up next is what I predict will be your favorite feature, Don't Matter To Me, featuring Michael Jackson, or with Michael Jackson. Honestly, he gets such top billing here, he's not even a real feature, it's kind of a duet. About to say, that was wild to me, that like these other living artists who feature in songs didn't get name-dropped. As, or credited as official features, but Michael Jackson did? Oh, yeah. Michael Jackson sure did. Michael Jackson's vocals that were used in Don't Matter to Me were part of an unreleased 1980 recording session with Paul Anka. The same session, actually, where he recorded Love Never Felt So Good and This Is It. Oh, I like Paul Anka. Yeah, I don't know if I know too much Paul Anka. Oh, I might have to keep that one in mind. Yeah, jot that down for future reference. Think about the clout you have to have to go approach Michael Jackson's estate and say, I would like some of your unreleased Michael Jackson material, please, to put on my album. I'll take one order of unreleased Michael Jackson material to go. With a side of fries. <laughs> yeah. Actually, In My Feelings is Jackson's first posthumous release to contain newly released unheard vocals since 2014. Obviously, it's pretty rare to get something like that. Some critics liked the feature. Some called it overproduced and auto-tuned to kind of sound similar to The Weeknd, very imitative. Some said that Drake was, quote, doing things because he can rather than because he should. Others, though, said MJ is, of course, amazing, and that in this case, Drake took a backseat and became the worst thing about his own song. What do you think? Is Drake the worst thing about his own song? Kinda. Yikes. <laughs> I don't disagree. Look, it's Michael Jackson, but still. Yeah. Obviously, pretty big hit. It's got half a billion streams. It charted in the top 10 in the US and Canada, as well as several countries worldwide, and it hit number one in Greece and Sweden. Sweden, once again, just loving stuff that Canada is loving less. Oh, yeah, I was... Uh, is it over yet? Not yet. <laughs> One song left. March 14. We should have done the whole episode on March 14th. Who knew? 
didn't realize. I was just really excited to talk about the album and Drake. Yeah, it's, it was such a surprise. <laughs> we would have talked about it sooner if we had done it on March 14th and when this actually comes out. Like, what? That's true. <laughs> Apparently, you weren't excited to talk about Drake. You stalled. I mean, I had to have enough time to listen to the album and stuff. Mm. Plus, March 14th on a Friday that the episode releases is like a year away. Fair enough. March 14th debuted at number 57 on the Hot 100, and this is one of the main tracks. I mean, we're back to talking about Drake, right? But I think we've had so long of a break from it when aren't we i know we've been talking about drake all episode i, I don't know i think i think march 14 <laughs> is kind of a, a return to form but it's a little refreshing because we've been so long without it or at least we've had the lens of like drake looking at other situations instead of drake talking about drake yeah but he does this deep dive on his child and his family life talking about all the ways that it's similar and different from his own upbringing and childhood he especially pushes back against the idea of a single father since he dealt so first-handedly with single parentage when he was a kid and people think that march 14 might be a pretty deliberate response to rumors and disses from push a t like we've seen on some other tracks but actually producer t minus insists that the song was around way before all that stuff and all those feuds were happening so who knows mm. yeah as for the date march 14th was apparently the day that Drake met Kanye in Wyoming to work on his record, Yay. It's also the day that he played Fortnite with the streamer Ninja. Super significant date in Drake's life, but also totally speculative, but probably the most likely thing, nevertheless. I think Drake pulled an Earth, Wind, and Fire on us. How did he do that? Well, back on episode 112, right, we talked about the song September and how the 21st night of September... They picked it for the song because it was Maurice White's wife's due date for the baby. People think that March 14th is when Drake found out that his partner was pregnant and he was going to be a father. Oh. Yeah, so it's a neat little Easter egg. I see. You know, there's been worse endings to an album, so I got to give this song at least <laughs> that credit. Congratulations, Drake. You get the Not the Worst Album Ending Award as well as the Russian Nesting Doll Award. <laughs> but speaking of worst endings, let's give it our best ending and do Final Spin. Oh, <laughs> all right. I don't have anything else to say. The first disc really surprised me. I think I liked a lot of the beats and the production. It's definitely the strongest point of this album. And actually, I did like a lot of the lyrics. If you can look past Drake talking about Drake, you can find a lot of those little hidden gem kind of lyrics and images placed throughout this album. It's long. It's a kind of a daunting listen if you do what <laughs> you had to deal with for the very first and only time yesterday and what I've done before and won't really do again. And that's listening to the whole thing intently. It's an album I'm going to put on, but I'm always going to find something else to do during it. You know what I mean? It's just that kind of an album for me. Music, given a 75. The R&B side of the album has a lot of better music. The first half is a little bit short, a little bit lacking. 75 there. 87 for the lyrics. 90 for the instruments in production, 84 for the overall vibe, given this record a final score of 82.9 and landing it at number 407. Just below Hall and Oates, Daryl Hall and John Oates, Abandoned Luncheonette, just above Stevie Ray Vaughan and The Sky is Crying. What about you? We've got to figure out your favorite feature. we got to figure out your top three. we got to figure out how many extra songs you're taking for your top three, because I know that's going to be tempting. <laughs> I see. And we got to get your score. Yes, uh, I 100% agree with you. I knew it. Case closed. Clip that. Somebody take that sound bite. This album could easily be something that you just put on as background music. Mm -hmm. I never want to have to focus on this album ever again. Stellar. A glowing <laughs> review. <laughs> too long. Too much about Drake. And I'm just over it. Yeah, I knew this would happen. I did like the B-side better, I think. Okay. And the reason I say that is because I think the A side kind of tainted me a little bit. It wore me down, right? So I didn't appreciate the B side as much. I think if I just listened to the B side first, I, w I would have liked it even more than I did end up liking it. Yeah. Right? I think it got weighed down by the first half. Totally. Especially for you and what you've expressed in the past about rap and just the way that you do it totally makes sense to me. Yeah. As for my favorite feature... I am going to give it to Jay-Z. Whoa! Nice. I found Jay-Z interesting. And, I, you know, I want to learn more about the guy I've, I already have heard so much about. Yeah, don't worry, you will. As for my top three in album order... You only have 25 tracks to pick from. This is going to be probably your least 
percentage of songs in your top three ever. Elevate. Elevate. Conorable mention to God's plan. As uh, on honorable mention. Wow. Okay. Nice for what? That's a huge jump. And in my feelings. Really? I wasn't sure if in my feelings would make it or not. There's always gonna be a huge jump somewhere. There was twenty five tracks. Like what? <laughs> okay, good point. Well, you could have just lopped a huge chunk off the end. I'm kind of surprised about In My Feelings. I know it's one of the bigger songs from the album. I just wasn't sure it would be the kind of thing you'd be into personally. Especially over something like Don't Matter to Me. Or like, I don't know, something singier. Yeah, I don't know. I just kind of liked In My Feelings. Okay, hey, that's how you feel. What are your thoughts for playlist picks? I want Nice For What on the playlist. I'm doubling down. No, that's fine. I will take that one because I also like that one. And I don't really have strong preferences on the other one. So I'll take Nice For What and you can have the other pick. Okay. Ooh, it's hard not to just take God's plan. If I were to take one that wasn't God's plan, it would maybe be Summer Games or or something like Sandra's Rose. I think you should probably just take... I should probably just take God's plan. Yeah. You're right. We should just take the two biggest songs from the album. Uh, <laughs> two of the three. But you're right. I just... I want them to come up when we shuffle the playlist. And genuinely, they are probably my two favorite songs. So... Fair enough. While the album has a lot more to offer than just those two. That's the way the cookie has crumbled. The Eminem cookie has crumbled. The Eminem cookie cookie has crumbled <laughs> <laughs> this one for me is getting four out of ten. Oh my goodness how you spell that <laughs> exactly as it sounds okay well great <laughs> four though hmm yeah a four that's kind of about what i expected i think Oh, uh, you kind of went into this hoping I'd like it since I liked Wiz Khalifa, right? Or whatever. Well, definitely I was curious to see. That, I mean, this is very little like Rolling Papers in a lot of ways. So I just wanted to kind of feel it out, you know, throw you some different elements. Sure. Yeah, this one's going right above Cheap Thrills by Janis Joplin, right below Murmur by R.E.M. Okay. It It is now your fifth four given on this podcast and the first four you've given since rem episode 79 <laughs> crazy you don't bring out a lot of bad stuff anyway that's gonna do it for this episode of spin it hope you liked it if you want more facts about drake check out the facts on the b side where can you find that you may ask yeah good question only one place one place only and that is www.spinitpod.com you can also find us many places, wherever you listen to podcasts. Almost everywhere. I hope you like us as much as Drake likes Drake. Be sure to click a thumbs up, give us five stars, a review, all the good fun things. Tell a friend who's celebrating a rebar mitzvah about the podcast. Ooh, that's good. You can find us on social media, at Official on Instagram, at SpinItPod on X, in all the fun places. Tune in next time to hear Connor say fun things like this. Eat kale, stay fit, die anyways. That's good. That one sounded like you had it ready to go. I did have it ready to go. I didn't Whoa. forget this week. <laughs> and if there's one thing you take away from this episode, remember Degrassi. Keep, Keep spinning. spinning. Well, you can admit it. Did you scrub ahead? Yeah, d yeah. did you scrub ahead? Hey. You better not have. You can tell us. It's okay. Oh. Can, oh, 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 it's not okay. Never mind. You better not have. Oh, I'll leave. <laughs> tell Connor. Yeah, hey. Hey, it's okay. You can tell me. We just, you know, we can't help you if you don't tell us, all right? You gotta, you, we know, so we just need to hear you say it, all right? Yeah. Tell us you scrubbed ahead so we can lock you up in the spin of jail, you whoa, piece whoa, of whoa, scum! Whoa, whoa, whoa. You, oh. Whoa, whoa. Oh. Sorry, I heard you yelling and I had to come back. Sorry. Be nice to them. They didn't know what they were scrubbing ahead to. Forgive him. We'll see you next week. The grassy is weak to the fiery, but strong against the watery. This has been a lesson in Drakey Mon. Gotta sing about them all. Only Drake. <laughs> Only Drake. <laughs>